All right, blast off. Here we are. Uh, my name is David Sarita. I, I first want to thank you all for coming here. So many serious um, UFO researchers and enthusiasts to travel so far to DC to see this. I know uh, from the Peter Jennings special uh, recently, a lot of UFOlogists have slammed it and complained about it. And they interviewed me for over 45 minutes and asked such intelligent questions. I thought this was going to be the best um, special ever done on television. And I got about 15 seconds in. And, and a lot of other researchers, even worse, some were just snipped all together. So I guess that's why we come here, um, to learn more, to get much deeper into this subject. And I don't waste any time on this. I mean, I've I, I been fascinated with the phenomena since uh, I was a little kid growing up in Berkeley in the 1960s. In 1967, I was born in 61. I was walking home from elementary school in the, in the East Bay of the Bay Area and saw this crowd of people looking pointing up at this thing on, on the streets. And I was an avid Star Trek fan with all my brothers in those days. So when everyone was pointing up and we looked up, we thought that was the USS Enterprise up there. And um, uh, wow, I mean, all these people looking at what is now the, you know, just the, the, the status symbol, a disc-shaped metallic craft just hovering up there for 20 minutes. And this thing was so close, I mean, as close as some of the footage Jaime Musan just saw. I mean, literally about 3,500 feet, and the craft was probably bigger than a 747. And it's just so clear. And you could see these waves, these spinning energy waves spinning around it. And after 20 minutes, still no military aircraft intervened, which means, you know, obviously they didn't pick this thing up on radar, or they were scared of it, or, or no one even noticed in the, in the military in, in the Bay Area of San Francisco. I, I find that hard to believe. But 20 minutes is a long time to be looking and my friend and I got bored, we started walking home, and then turned around, and it's still there. And then it just went invisible in a blink of an eye. To, to see metallic, a metallic craft go invisible in a blink of an eye is, is it's like a Zen koan. I mean, it, it takes you your life. You've got to sit there and meditate on that and find out how that, how that all happened. So once, you know, as I started growing up and I learned that UFOs were a phenomena, they were not from our planet, or perhaps they were black ops, you know, secret military projects, I became more and more interested in UFOs. And I spent a lot of my life working on the environment. You know, I've worked you know, right in the dirt, planting trees in the mountains of British Columbia and Alaska and some in California. I planted over one and a quarter million trees in 20 years. And I had a lot of time to think out there, uh, just bending over planting trees in the rain and the snow and the heat. I've done oil spill cleanup. And I've also, in the in early 1990s, I directed the LA-based Tesla Foundation. And we promoted scientific discoveries for a better environment. And I went on to form my own company called Green and Blue Corporation, where I had this, con con uh, this consortium of scientists who had technologies or de were developing technologies that would profoundly affect our planet and our envir environment and our, our energy uh, status. One of them was you know, a bunch of MIT physicists, a uh, main scientist named Dr. Bogdan Castle Maglish, was working on helium-3 fusion. And helium-3 fusion is so energetic that nine grams of it, which you can hold in your hand, can produce the energy equivalent of 1,000 barrels of crude oil. Um, if you had a, um, beyond a hydrogen fuel cell, if you had a helium-3 fuel cell in your car, um, you could run your car for probably 10 years before you recharged it. Um, at that time, uh, James Fletcher, who was head of NASA in the late 80s, was very, very interested in this technology for both it being a miniature space-based power source, but also because of its propulsion aspect. Uh, helium-3 produces highly charged protons. It doesn't produce any heat, which is you know, mostly in, in nuclear reactions, you, you get heat uh, when you slow fission uranium, and you've got to boil water, and then you've got to turn turbines and, and, and produce electricity a very long and, and complicated way in a very dangerous way. Well, helium-3 has no radioactivity. It's found abundantly in moon dust. 
um, Clinton Ashworth, who was the supervising mechanical engineer of Pacific Gas and Electric, told me that a cargo bay full of moon dust in the space shuttle has enough helium-3 in it to power the entire United States' energy demands for a single year. That's heating your homes, driving your cars, you know, all the electricity in our homes. That's how profound this nuclear fuel is. In fact, Richard Hoagland has pointed out what may be alien mining operations on the moon. And it, it came to my attention that they were probably mining helium-3. Um, it came uh, to the awareness of NASA that the, the future of propulsion was that we started with rockets and we were going to go into what were called ion or nuclear propulsion system drives, which NASA has you know, got on the table. They're, they're working on this stuff and, the, and they're, they're dreaming up using ion propulsion systems for satellites. And they had, they've had these ideas from you know, way back in the, in the late 70s and 80s. Nuclear propulsion started in, in the 1950s and 60s at EG&G, one of our top defense contractors. They were doing tests out at, uh, in Nevada. On, on a device called Phobos 1 and Phobos 2, where they had successfully demonstrated nuclear propulsion, but their devices were very radioactive because they used radioactive fuels. So if we propose that cases like Betty Cash and some of the others we've heard about where there's the, these severe radiation burns, I would imagine it's possible those are ours coming out of Area 51. They may be robotically controlled because they're so radioactive that no human could get near them. But helium-3 has no radioactivity, and it was it was really a strong uh, desire of, of uh, James Fletcher at NASA to, to fund this. So they actually approached Congress, and I actually got very involved in the project. I was talking to guys like Earl Van Landingham, who then was director of all propulsion power and energy at NASA. And that's when you know, I made some big connections over at the agency, and I got into a lot of interesting dialogues about how they wanted this thing funded. Well, in 1983, I spoke here in Congress in the House of Representatives with a panel of brilliant Maxwell Prize winning physicists, Nobel Prize winning physicists, and top MIT physicists, all telling Congress um, that we should be funding this particular scientist's research into this device. And they turned it down five times in a row, including Al Gore, whose um, experts were sitting in the audience listening that day, and half the panel was missing. And Al Gore never followed up on it, and never wanted to do anything about it. And for me, being an environmentalist, that was, that was a big letdown, that Al Gore was not taking this seriously. And today, 2005, we can actually see the end of oil. It's in headlines, it's in Forbes, it's in Fortune 500 magazines that, you know, 2026, that's going to be the end of cheap oil. So we have to find a new way uh, to, to power our vehicles and, and to move around. So UFOs, for me, obviously, beckon us with that most profound uh, you know, insight that, that it's really possible to move throughout the universe at, at subliminal speeds beyond the speed of light, even the speed of light, which are far beyond any of our capabilities today. The space shuttle does about 18,000 miles an hour as it orbits the Earth, and the speed of light is 670 million miles an hour. So my interest in UFOs was that, one, they beckon us with the obviously an energy source or a technology that could solve all of our needs on this planet. We could stop global warming, we could stop ozone depletion, and we could, we could really become much more evolved human beings. So I'm not just interested in just being in awe, they're here. I mean, I, I want to go way, way past that. Um, I think everybody in this room pretty much is convinced it's most likely they're here. But do we want to just keep looking up there and saying, you know, wow, I mean, somebody's got this figured out. I mean, when da Vinci saw birds flying, what did he do? He wanted to fly. Uh, and, and, and this country is where all those revelations have happened. I mean, they, the, the, the Wright brothers, you know, the, the, the automobile, the computer. Nikola Tesla came from Yugoslavia to develop all of his inventions here. This is the country where it all happened. What I'm afraid of, and, and the point that I make very clear on a lot of my radio interviews today, is that are we making a mistake by laughing at this in the media and, and especially not taking it serious in our mainstream universities? You know, Princeton and MIT, where we have all these, you know, and Harvard, all these top uh, physicists working. And, and you can't get these guys to come and actually look at this stuff and spend the time that you're all spending here in UFO University for three days. I mean, just three days. Just, just, if you could just cram them all in this room and get them to look. Do, are we willing to take the chance that maybe China and Russia and Iran right now are actually uh, building consortiums and doing research into the UFO phenomena and perhaps uh, they will figure this out before us. Um, I mean, 
in a lot of ways, I'm patriotic. I believe in world peace. I believe in nonviolence. But I've been to Saudi Arabia. I, w I was there by accident when we were, we were struck in the Twin Towers. And those people live in such oppression that they are afraid to talk in public about anything controversial. And when you, when you live, even, I was only there for two weeks. And in two weeks, I just wanted to come home. I wanted to come home where I could talk about anything. I didn't have to worry about you know, whether I was you know, a Christian, which I am a Catholic, or into the New Age, or, or into alternative thinking, or UFOs. I didn't, I didn't want to live in that fear anymore. And my friends over there did live in that fear. So the very idea that a country like that might possess this type of technology before us is a threat to national security. It's a threat to our freedom. Because this freedom is something that was paid for in blood, I hate to say it, but guys died so that we could be up here and talk about UFOs. And I don't believe in violence. It's a last resort, always it's a last resort. But there are people, if they had this kind of power, this kind of military advantage, they would use it against us. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not convinced that, that China wouldn't. I really believe they would if they possessed it fully in, in their military uh, you know, technology. So do, if we have this stuff in a black ops level and we're really working on it, great. Do we have an arsenal, a fleet of UFOs that are our own? That would be comforting to know if, if we really did have that. But considering what I saw in, was in 1967, 68, and that has not been made public, and when we made the stealth, you know, the B-2 bomber, it, it stayed secret for years, but now we all know about it. Would we really be keeping this stuff secret for this long and not use it in our defense? Would we not announce to the world, as we always have bragged, when we have made a new discovery? When, when the Wright brothers flew, the whole world knew about it. When Tesla all and, and Stone and Lodge invented radio, the whole world knew about it. And Marconi followed up and, and broadcast across the Atlantic. We've always been boastful about what we've discovered. So my, my fear is that, that we're, we're, we're asleep at the wheel. The Roman Empire fell when they were too confident, when they thought they had conquered the world. And there's no better place and there's no better scientists in the world than America to take this subject seriously. So myself being around Nobel Prize winners and top physicists, um, I started doing some probing around and asking people like Earl Van Landingham at NASA about UFOs. And they never laughed at me once. And in 1994, Martin Stubbs, program manager of a cable TV station in Vancouver, Canada, approached me through a mutual friend and said, David, you know, why don't you take all this footage of what may be UFOs and conduct a study into the scientific community? That's a study that I did for six or seven years, and I continue to this day to, to get very deeply in. And the thing that occurred to me most of all, obviously, was the revolution in propulsion that UFOs beckon us with. And every, on, on all the best footage I saw, I, you can actually see this if you just watch Jaime's video the one that was really low down. You can see the field. It's, it's a very transparent energy field vibrating around the craft. And in um, the NASA tapes, the NASA transmissions, I quickly learned that NASA was looking into the invisible, where the human eye can't see. Not just the infrared, but you know we see from the color red to the color violet, and that makes up the white light spectrum. But they were looking in the ultraviolet. And why were they looking there? Why, why did they have special black and white cameras looking into the ultraviolet and the infrared as well as the visible? Maybe because they knew there was something going on there. And I noticed in, in these missions, classically, I mean, you, you hear this all the time, that these UFOs make sudden stops, right angle turns, suddenly accelerate. Um, and you can also all see them all strobing or pulsing. The word pulsing comes up all the time. So I actually started to look right at the pulses very closely, blowing the frames up and analyzing those waves because I, I had, you know, having worked for all these nuclear physicists, I had to take a crash course in Einstein and Max Planck and Richard Feynman, all of the classics. And I think I, I could translate what those waves were telling us, the very secret to their propulsion system. So I'm not going to be able to go into great deal about my theory and propulsion and what I've developed, but what I have developed today has caught the attention of, of, of top physicists and, and even people at NASA have approached me to, to submit formally to the Johnson Space Center my theory, which is now a 50-page paper that I'm submitting to, to various places throughout the country. And in essentially, in a nutshell, before we start running video, consider all the movements of UFOs and consider the G-forces. If anyone has flown here and made you know, angular turns, you can feel that strong pull you get in your head that, that can sometimes almost knock you out. 
Well, if you were doing even 30 miles an hour and then turned right all of a sudden, what would happen? You would hit the windshield, go through the windshield, or be spam against the wall in, in, inside of your car or, or whatever your aircraft is. G-forces are very powerful, and as you accelerate faster and faster, even small turns produce enormous Gs. Well, UFOs exhibit properties that tell me a very important clue, that they, these craft are what I call, is in principle, zero mass gravity effect craft. They're able to um, transform mass into a unique state that reduces the mass gravity effect down towards zero, where they get to be as light as photons, as light as light particles. Once a craft is that light and transformed that effectively down to zero mass gravity effect, you can not only make high-speed turns without any g-forces, you can accelerate and go towards the speed of light and beyond with tiny amounts of energy. Today, the amount of energy in, in, in uh, propulsion that is required to get even one-tenth the speed of light, this was a conversation I had with Earl Van Lan Lanningham, Director of Propulsion and Power at NASA. He was interested in the helium-3 fusion because helium-3 produced 18 million electron volt charged protons, which are which gets into ion propulsion drives. Well, what does that mean? I mean, that's just a number, 18 million electron volts. Well, that's the actual energy charge on protons, and protons is where most of the mass is in, in matter or, or fuel. And if you can open up the back of this little miniature reactor and fire protons out at one-tenth the speed of light, eventually you will be going forward the opposite direction at one-tenth the speed of light, which is 67 million miles an hour. That's faster than any satellite, any aircraft, anything we have today. So you can imagine why they were so interested in it. Well, the problems with as you go faster and faster, g-forces increase, and then impeding objects, debris or meteorite, micrometeorites, start to come at you. And if you want to turn out of the way, the g-forces are going to destroy you. So it really doesn't work. You can't really go too fast without encountering g-force. So the more I looked at, the, at, the, at UFO phenomena and looking at even Jaime's tape this afternoon, the waves are always present in good footage. You can see these waves. And therein lies the secret to how they, they build these wave generators in their craft and they transform mass. So that mass, in a sense, starts to become transparent, translucent first, so you can almost see through it. Um, like uh, Lynn Cate's film last night, that when people saw the, the big triangle uh, over, over flying over Arizona, you could see the points of light in the formation, but you could see this translucent mass where there were little wavelets but you could see through it. Um, that's what happens when mass starts, the, starts to reduce. And I'm not talking about using balsa wood and aluminum. I'm talking about actually taking steel and transforming it into a quality that resembles light or photon energy. And once you take your pilot and your craft and you wave transform them, and, and I've gotten very precise on how this is done on the quantum level. That means the atom and smaller. Then, and once you can do that, you can, you can, in a sense, break Einstein's law. Mass in its current state, Einstein says, cannot attain the speed of light. And that is because the faster you go, the background of space pushes on you and makes you heavier. When a boat moves through water, the water impedes on the boat. The boat gets heavier. And if you want to go faster, that, that motor has to be working even harder and harder and harder just to go a little bit faster. And eventually, you get to a point where you weigh as much as the totality of the mass of the background of whatever you're pushing against, whether it's the whole lake or the whole ocean or the whole background of space. So you can only get to 99%. Well, in particle accelerators, um, at, at, such as CERN out here in Chicago, we're, we've proven Einstein correct. We can accelerate protons to 99.99% the speed of light. But in order to get a proton to that speed, it takes a trillion electron volts of energy. There are no nuclear fuels that can produce a trillion electron volts of energy. We can only coil it for a fraction of a second. When we detonated the nuclear bombs in Nevada, um, um, plutonium explosions, uranium, which becomes plutonium, releases 200 million electron volts of total nuclear force energy. So a trillion is 5,000 times more energy than that. So, and also, there's this huge increase in mass and weight, which would destroy a pilot and destroy a craft even before it got there. So, and, and the exotic ideas of wormholes. Wormholes, very beautiful theories. I mean, you know, spiraling wormholes, folding two points of space and time together. They require the negative energy of 100 million suns, the total energy they put out for a whole year. That's, there are 100 million suns in our galaxy. 
That means all this, the negative solar energy they put out for a whole year to make one wormhole enough to fit a quarter through. The wider the snout in a wormhole gets, this is Kip Thorne from Caltech. You know, this is his physics. It takes even more energy than that. What civilization can harness levels of energy like that? I think all of the physics we know today is telling us that that is not the way these UFOs are doing it. I mean, it, it's like you're going to cram your head against the wall if you look at the equations and what it takes to accelerate mass towards those levels of energy. But if you wave transform mass, and, and you can even use the spiritual model of Christ in the resurrection. He took physical mass and he transformed it to light when he, when he resurrected. And then he was free to move about. He was able to appear in the Americas and, and all over the universe. So if, if it can be done on a quantum level, a single atom, it can be done on a larger scale. And I believe that is, if you look more and more through the UFO phenomena, you're going to see evidence of that. And, and what's, run, what's run in the presentation, and, and just listen to Gordon Cooper, one of our great American heroes who, who flew to, on, on Gemini and Apollo, and the way he describes the movement of these crafts. Astronaut Gordon Cooper is an picture? American hero with a log of over 222 hours of manned space flight. He had a long and illustrious career of service to his country. With over 11,000 hours of flight, he was a fighter pilot, U-2 test pilot in the Air Force, and is one of the first men to ever fly in space. He orbited the Earth 22 times in Phase 7, the last of the Mercury missions, on May 15th and 16th of 1963. On August 21st of 1965, he orbited the Earth again on Gemini 5 and remained a backup for Apollo 10. But while Gordon Cooper was an Air Force pilot stationed in Munich, Germany in 1951 in the 86th Fighter Bomber Group where he flew F-84s and F-86s, Cooper testifies to having chased disc-shaped UFOs that outmaneuvered the most advanced fighter jets of our time. We were flying in Germany and we were flying F-86s and they would come over and do the same maneuvers that we make except every once in a while one of them would go zip and you just can't do that in a fighter, a conventional fighter. They're just typical uh, saucer shape, double lenticular shape, metallic looking. Well, yeah, they weren't just random. They were flying. Uh, they were flying fighter formations, very definitely under positive control. I was having some cameramen film the installation of a, of a precision landing facility we were putting in right on the edge of the dry lake. And this saucer flew right over them and put down three little gear and landed out on the dry lake bed. And they went out to, uh, <coughs> picked up their cameras and moved on out toward him filming. And he lifted off, put the gear back in the well, and climbed out at a very high rate of speed and disappeared. And so while I was uh, going through all the regulation books and finding out the number to call in Washington to report it, uh, I had them go over and develop the film. By the time they got back with the developed film, I was on the higher and higher and higher <coughs> level officer talking to me, finally with the colonel telling me to uh, you know, when the film arrived at my desk to put it in the carrier pouch, there would be a courier there at my office by that time already, and, and they'd arrange for him to fly in our base airplane back to Washington with these films, and uh, do not run prints, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We didn't have a chance to run it. I had a chance to hold it up to the window and look at it. It was certainly a good film. Well, by this time I was involved in the research and development and doing very classified programs myself, you know, at the test center. So I knew that we didn't have any vehicles of that kind, and I was 99 or 9 sure that the Russians didn't have any of that type either. So it certainly, there certainly was 
At that point in time, there was no doubt in my mind that this vehicle was uh, made at some other place than here on Earth. And yeah, well, Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon coming true. <laughs> Very quickly I learned that NASA was looking into the ultraviolet, where, the, where humans don't see. And uh, that, that starts to explain, like once a craft is zero mass and photonic, it just has to change frequency and go ultraviolet or X-ray or to gammas and it's invisible. Um, infrared is, is, is also, there's a lot, I'll explain later about infrared why it's also a good area to look. Ultraviolet light is very hot. It leaves a temperature on the humidity in the atmosphere, which can be picked up on infrared, essentially. Now notice the translucency of these objects. This is STS-80, which is 1996, late in 1996. And they're actually gathering here in a formation. They're going to form a, a circle, and then one will fly into the center of the circle. And, you know, when you hear stories at NASA that this is, you know, I mean, you can even see the object moving up above. When you hear people at NASA saying this is just debris near the camera lens, and they're using CCD cameras that have flawless depth of field, meaning once the camera's in focus, an inch away from the camera's in focus, and so is, you know, 300 miles away is in focus at the same time. Uh, none of these things could be out of focus to uh, debris. And would debris gather in a circle, as you're about to see, uh, can debris behave like that and actually, you know, exhibit itself intelligently? the orbs that are pulsing. Very pulsing. Once they reach their position, now look at the one passing in the upper field here. It's going to be heading in right into the center. And notice the one just lighting up as it hits its position in, in, the, in the formation. I find it hard to believe this is dust. I mean, it's... How does it do that? Very faint now, very translucent mass state. The pulse, it has to do with the wave generator. I don't believe you're seeing the UFOs itself, you're only seeing the, the field. The, um, with infrared, when a, when a magnetic pulse moves through an atmosphere, or even space atmosphere, it creates friction, which is heat, and that shows up on infrared. The waves on themselves are very visible. If we look here, what you're about to see, this is the, this is the Earth down here. You'll, the, one of the first things you'll see on the screen is a little pulsing object. It's actually quite... You'll see a very big kind of translucent ball with a hole in the middle, very similar to the rest of our UFOs, kind of streaking by and going into the distance. And slowly, slowly, slowly as it goes into the distance, you can see it getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So we were experiencing the depth of field of one of these large disks as it's moving past, way, way past the space shuttle and into the far distance. It basically reaches a point, and once it reaches this point of its destination, it stops moving, and then it becomes extra luminous. It starts to give off some extra light. When the mass is and very slowly, low, also, what we start to see is a formation, an actual circular formation, kind of looking at an angle in, into this formation. We can see these objects that are slowly moving into position and then actually lighting up. Once they hit their positions, they're lighting up. This is suggesting incredible intelligence, something you wouldn't expect for space debris or space junk or some sort of natural phenomena. You certainly couldn't expect that meteorites or shooting stars could, could fly through space and then stop at a point and then all of a sudden give off this extra luminosity. The luminosity is constant once they start giving it off. As the camera starts to slowly go away and it's moving over the curvature of the earth, we see more and more of these things coming into position and then once they reach their positions they light off. And then finally we see another object kind of like this one coming in from the foreground and heading towards the center of the circle. It becomes very very faint, you can barely see it on the screen as it's moving into position. And finally when it gets into what appears to be the center of the circle, it literally just starts shining like a diamond and its light is luminous and continuous. This whole formation suggests amazing intelligence and amazing organization. Could this be something staged by...
NASA STS-75. This is also ultraviolet, way more Sorry, energy in the ionosphere than the Get it on the, get it on the TV cord, please. Which is a good thing. TV. The tether is broken. Copy. Now remember, this is ultraviolet Columbia and the uh, satellite now, 77 nautical miles apart. Again, that call reporting that uh, the crew can see the tether and uh, see the satellite, to, that it's beautiful. They look like amoebas, but they're much bigger. And then notice they're all going different velocities. This view uh, showing... Uh, Had that been debris, Debris in, in Galileo and Newtonian physics can't move through a gravitational field at different velocities. And, and notice they're all going different the velocities. The satellite. That's very curious. And they never bump into Again, each other. Uh, if it was debris, into that, you, know, you think two pieces would hit each other. It never happens. 81 nautical miles now from Columbia. Yeah, I think, I think it's possible a lot of UFOs could be life forms. You're about to see someone coming up who believes in that. The, the pioneer of invisible photography, Trevor Constable, is coming up after this. It overloaded. There was too much energy in the ionosphere, uh, more than they calculated, so it shorted out, it snapped. And Yeah, the, the actual, there's, there's actually classified reports um, on NASA's the site about certain aspects of this incident. Franklin, uh, we see a long line, a couple of star-like things, and a lot of things swimming in the foreground. Can you describe what you're seeing? Well, the long line is, uh, is a tether, um, and uh, there's a little bit of debris that uh, kind of flies with us, and uh, it's uh, illuminated by the sun at such low angles. So this was the, the west coast of uh, northern Africa. I actually slowed the waves the down and took pictures of them and ran them through, through a wave apart. clock and, and pretty much... Um, uh, the, uh, the satellite is visible on that uh, strand. This is, uh, I confirmed with uh, top scientists at NASA that this camera sees near UV photons. They also have cameras that see infrared, and this camera is seeing visible and near UV. And near UV is as wide in bandwidth as from red to violet. It's a huge, huge spectrum. Ultraviolet is divided into ultraviolet near, ultraviolet far, and ultraviolet ex extreme. And all three of those combined are about six or seven times as wide as the bandwidth that the human eye sees. So it's an enormous spectrum to search for phenomena. How what? It's 12 miles long. We're about to get into that. They, because they go behind the tether, Satellite to now. we can use the, the, the length of the tether to measure their diameter. 100 nautical miles. Very busy day, like Hamu Musan's videos, you know, 150 UFOs. Focus, but I can't get better than that. OK, Claude, thank you. Good to zoom in now. Well, this is, of all the stuff Martin Stubbs collected, this is like the mother load. This, this is the day when a lot of them showed up. In the summer of 1999, I met with Martin Stubbs, the program manager of the cable TV station, who had recorded over 400 hours of NASA's live broadcast. He gave me some videotape on a new incident that happened in February of 1996 on space shuttle mission STS-75. In the summer of 1999, I met with Martin Stubbs, the Oops. program manager of the cable TV station, who had recorded over 400 hours of NASA's live broadcast. It skipped. He gave me some videotape on a new incident that happened in February of 1996 on space shuttle mission STS-75, um, what was called the tether incident. So what you just saw on the videotape showed a 12-mile long satellite, a satellite attached to a 12-mile long tether, which is like a conductor cable. It's a very, very thin uh, one-tenth of, of a centimeter in, in thickness cable that was used to conduct electricity in the Earth's ionosphere. As we saw earlier, space is supercharged with high energy particles and NASA was trying to take advantage of these particles to see if they could build up a charge on the tether and actually see a gain or produce some electricity. They charged the tether with some, with some electricity but then an overload of highly charged product particles flooded the tether and produced so much electricity it snapped. 
On February 25th at about 7.30 p.m., the tether broke away from the shuttle Columbia and drifted about 77 miles away. So the scene you, that you just saw actually starts at about 77 miles away. The camera pans down. We see a long line, which is 12 miles long of tether, a small satellite attached to the end, and then a swarm of little objects, little balls of light, just moving in from all different directions and different velocities and different speeds. Then the cameras actually zoom in, and we actually get to take a close look at what we're seeing here. It's astounding. We see up here in the right-hand corner, we see a very large disk clearly going behind the tether. And we, look, we can actually see little, little black dots racing around to suggest some sort of a magnetic field effect. And coming through the middle, we see another very large disk moving clearly behind the tether. The light from the tether shines in front of, of the background object, which is the UFO. Um, if we use this piece of wood as an example, we can see what a disk looks like when it's passing behind a foreground object. It's really very quite simple. So if the, if the disk was passing in front of the tether, it would look something like this, and it doesn't look like that. When we look in the middle and we see this large disk passing through the middle, we can see again it's passing, it's passing behind the tether. If this was the tether and this was the UFO, we could clearly see it's going behind. And if it was going in front, it would look something like this. It doesn't look like that. So because we know the shuttle is at least 77 miles away and drifting further away from the object, from the tether, and we know the objects are going behind the tether, we can therefore use the 12 mile length of the tether as a relative measuring rod for um, actually making measurements of the minimum diameters of some of these disks. And according to my calculations, against the 12 mile length of the tether, this disk passing through the top section here measures a minimum of two to three miles in diameter. That's assuming it's right up next to the back of the tether. If it's actually farther behind the tether than I think, then the disk could be much, much larger. The further it gets behind it relative to the distance of the tether, the larger it actually is in reality in compared to A little bigger than the, the Phoenix tether. UFO. Again, here, this disk going through the middle here, um, I, I estimate it to be between two and three miles in diameter. And the same translucent mass. If a UFO were flying over the city of Los Angeles in the downtown core or New York, and it was two to three miles wide in diameter, it would black out the entire sky. It would be an Independence Day sized craft that would, that would literally um, cause massive panic and massive alarm. But again, when you consider that the cameras on the space shuttle here are, are seeing into the near ultraviolet spectrum of light, as we, as we learned earlier, it's a spectrum of light that's too high in energy for us to see with our eyes. But because the camera can see into it, it, it can basically be capable of capturing an image that is so high in energy that although we can't see it with our eyes, it, it actually still is there. We just can't actually see it. Earlier I suggested how if a UFO were capable of doing light speed travel, a solid object initially, and it could change its frequency into high frequency energy, the UFO would still, or spaceship, would still have actual structure to it. It would actually still have mass, but in its high frequency state it would turn into pure energy. Therefore, as it would appear on a camera, it would be very translucent. It would look like energy even though it has structure. And that's exactly what these objects look like. They look like almost transparent, translucent uh, disks, which actually as they pass behind some background stars, you can actually see starlight shining through them to suggest that they're in a pure wave or energy, energy form. So, and again, this one, we can see the actual magnetic field rotating very, very quickly around the craft, suggesting that what we're looking at is pure energy mass vibrating at a very high frequency. Across the top of the screen we can see a very powerful pulsing coming off of one of the UFOs as it moves across the screen. Later I would look very closely at the wave patterns on the UFO and study the wave patterns and find some incredible, incredible conclusions, incredible quantum, quantum physics and quantum energy equations. But we'll look at that much later. For now, we're left with the most astounding event ever captured on film. The largest UFOs ever captured on film, two to three miles in diameter, and, and quite conclusive, they're definitely going behind the tether. They can't be uh, produced by some sort of an optical illusion. If this is the tether way in the background and the camera to the space shuttle is way up here, you know, you can get a really bad um, reading against using the tether, the 12 mile length of the tether, 
as any sort of relative measuring rod. But I'm not doing that. We are confirming, and it's very obvious when you look at the tape, that the UFOs are going behind the tether. Now this came to my attention after my first film. All through the early records of the UFO phenomenon, repeatedly we have seen the factor of invisibility Notice the present translucent itself, disc on its side with the black hole in the center. There are numerous examples dating from the earliest times of objects that were seen to disappear into nothingness and at other times to appear as though out of nowhere. Trevor took these photos There in was extensive radar corroboration of this phenomenon Black right from the earliest days in which records were kept of, of these happenings. One of them was the now famous Nancy Shoto case which was during World War II when fighters from jet, jet uh, or not jet fighters, but they were fighters from a, a carrier off the Nancy Shoto Islands south of Okinawa, they were vectored onto incoming objects that should have been visible and when they were vectored into their immediate vicinity the pilots aloft still couldn't see them. In the meantime the skipper down on the deck of the carrier is going nuts because they're saying we can't see anything, we can't see anything and the combat information center was reporting that they were they were in amongst them, right on them. But things like this uh, have been repeated occurrences. It's not an isolated thing. That just happens to be the probably the most significant of all the all the uh, incidents in the immediate post-war period that have found their way into public record. Trevor's photos are remarkably similar to the NASA UFOs with the dark centers. Now I propose I've had conversations with people at SETI, and they've admitted to me that the spectrum they're looking at, they're looking down in you know the, the billion hertz range, the gigahertz range in radio waves, and that if an extraterrestrial civilization were broadcasting from another star system, they would be broadcasting much higher frequency. Although we can see higher frequency waves and detect them, we can't take information out of them yet. For example, X-rays and gamma rays, which are ultra high in frequency, we can actually uh, detect them, but we can't pull information out of a gamma wave. Um, longer or shorter wavelengths distort as they travel through the universe and they encounter other waves and you get collisions and they all get very, very messed up. For example, if you're in a room having a conversation and everyone's talking at the same time, you don't know what anybody's saying. But if a very high frequency wave pierced the room, everybody would hear it. That's because the lower frequency waves of the human voice, when they collide against each other, they scatter. Um, and they admit it classically. Now these photos have been taken on regular digital cameras, when the photographer took the picture, he didn't see the UFO. In this case, in Dorchester, England, a very structured object showed up when he came home and downloaded his, his photography. This is to further demonstrate the invisibility factor and that there's something about digital cameras where they're actually able to see these things um, that are invisible to the naked eye, which gives further evidence that they're really here. I think this is worth experimenting on, I mean, buying a digital camera and just taking pictures at random and seeing what you get. Never do the witnesses see the UFO at the time of photography. And look, again, look at how similar this is to the NASA UFO, translucent light mass, and you can see the streak mark, which means it was going by very fast. And uh, again, it, it has a kind of a knob in the center and it's very translucent mass state, completely invisible at the time of photography. So the magic of digital cameras are that somehow they're able to see these wavelengths you know, way into the ultraviolet uh, that we can't see. And that UFO in the shuttle just suddenly became visible. It's as if jumping frequencies and dimensions. This one I really took a liking to because I've had a personal experience with these. Uh, these are non-mechanistic. These are purely uh, as if an intelligent glass-like or translucent uh, field um, 
and I actually had an experience with one of these guys, and that's why, again, this was invisible at the time of photography. $5,000 Nikon high-res digital camera. Incredible, incredible shape, and you can see the sunlight shining off of it, so it's definitely physical. It's definitely got mass, but its mass is very low. Very, very translucent. I've actually seen one of these things, and uh, I, I can't tell you what happened. It's, it's a very spiritual experience, but look at this one up here. Also, this particular photograph, there's a lot of violet light color in the images, especially if you look at the original on the internet. Um, UFOevidence.org is where I borrowed some of these photos. Um, the violet light possibly is, is coming from the UFO. So many owners of photos do not put contact information on their photographs, and I would like to use them in my, my upcoming film with Dan Aykroyd called Unplugged on UFOs. It's going to be premiering tonight here. It will be, they're, they're showing it in the Cannes Film Festival, and Lionsgate's Films is releasing it all over North America in the, in the fall. And it's just really frustrating to go and see so much good photography, and yet no contact information. I mean, I don't want to use photos outside of a lecture. The Fair Use Act you know, uh, states that I can use anybody's photos in a lecture for uh, educational purposes, but I can't put them in a film to be released by a studio. So um, if anybody has really good UFO footage, and I'm interested in Jaime's footage as well, or stills, uh, come to me at my table. I mean, I'll actually pay licenses to use some of them. Um, I'm looking for a few more for, for my film. Uh, and now, you know, if you have any questions, uh, one thing I want to point out too, why is the tether so wide? Um, in the official NASA report, it was the electrostatic field around the tether. Sunlight was bouncing off of the field, and because the cameras are very low light sensitive, they were able to pick up that, that actual width of the field up. Uh, in the front here first. That physicist, he went on to bomb detection, uh, a revolutionary detection for airport security, and I was president of the company for a couple of years. We revolutionized bomb detection. X-rays are essentially very good at seeing suspicious looking objects, but if you, for example, take a battery in a camera and you fill it with C4 plastic explosives, um, an X-ray wouldn't know what it is. But we developed detectors that can scan using an advanced form of radiation and get chemical signatures in one second. He went on to doing that because he was so frustrated with all the rejection. He actually spent $27 million on three test models at Princeton, where they did early tests in, in the 1980s. And, and from that point on, when the interest got really serious, I mean, we had Murray Gelman, Nobel Prize winner, Gwen Seaborg, chairman of the AEC, I mean, Clifford Scholl, tons of, of Nobel laureates supporting, saying, Congress, let's put money in this. And they all said no. And, and I got involved in the company trying to raise money and introducing them to billionaires and to and banking firms. Whenever we had an interested financial source, they confided in Department of Energy, and DOE told them to stay away. Don't put money in this. So I got on the phone with the head of the DOE fusion program, and this is in the late 80s. And even NASA, oh, let me back up, James Fletcher, head of NASA, and Earl Van Landingham, head of propulsion, they asked Congress, well, would you guys give us money? We'll do it. Turned them down. Why? I mean, and now we're seeing the end of oil within sight. And scientists like Bogdan Maglitch, who developed the helium-3 fusion project, is in his late uh, 70s now and, you know, is risking, I don't know, hopefully he'll live into his 90s, but it gets more and more dangerous to lose such a precious and valuable genius. Um, John Nash, the brilliant mathematician and, and scientist from the, the movie Beautiful Mind, if you look in the book, he says that it was extraterrestrials that gave him the insights to solve these most complicated math formulas, math problems. Now that's in the book and that's not in the movie. Um, if Einstein told us he was talking to aliens, would we have locked him up and would we have learned as much from him as we have today if he told us something like that? I mean, these are, I mean, many, I think it's possible ETs may be communicating through scientists, uh, whether they are even aware of it or not. The very fact that we can prove the invisibility factor, Jaime Musson and, and the Mexican sightings have shown the infrared capabilities. Ultraviolet is far more advanced than infrared. And also, as you've seen it with digital cameras, I urge you all to go to ufoevidence.org and look at their slideshow and look at how many incredible photos. And, and the witnesses never saw the UFO at the time of photography. 
So technically, they could be in our presence and communicating through us via telepathy and affecting our, our creative consciousness. In the back. Well, that's a great question. I mean, you could, they almost look curious. Their movement, you know, reminds you of, of disturbed uh, bees, in, you know, or they, they, sent, they have a sense of curiosity about them. It could have been the energy. Um, I, had a, I have a theory about Roswell, and, and this, you really have to get deeply into my, into my physics work to fully understand this, but curiously, Roswell, the Roswell crash and the Socorro crash and the Plains of St. Augustine crash all happened around the Trinity site. In, in the first week of July, 1947. We tested the first nuclear bomb on July 5th, some say the 14th of 1945. Now, ima may imagine the same curiosity going on there, UFOs that are vibrating in gamma wavelengths, really high frequency UFOs, which are invisible to us. The only thing that would actually affect them or punch them would be a wavelength that's similar to their own. Um, for example, the Battle of 42 uh, UFO was presented here a few days, uh, yesterday, I think it was. We fired munitions in 42 uh, at this transparent mass UFO, and the munitions go right through it. They don't touch it because its mass is very transparent, um, and they explode all around it. Well, if, if you send a gamma wavelength, equal the same wavelength of the UFO at it, and a strong force, what would happen? Well, in a nuclear blast, uh, using plutonium, you get huge release. You get 200 million electron volts of energy, and, you, and a lot of those are gammas, very high, 200 MeV gammas. That's, those are strong gammas. And, and theoretically, they may have knocked the UFOs out away from, from Trinity, but we didn't see the effects too, until two years later. Why? Because in, in Einstein physics, the, as you approach the speed of light, time slows down. As particles increase in frequency, for them, time slows down. That would mean in a higher dimensional frequency, it would take us lo a long time to actually see the effects of what actually happens in those higher dimensional frequencies. So it's possible, because the dates match up, and so do, so do the geographical locations on either side of Trinity, you have UFO crashes, that they would have been disturbed. That terrifyingly reveals their weakness, that, that gamma, gamma rays or, or gamma weapons could be used against them. Um, but like everything, everything has a weakness. So the reason we saw them in solid manner is we were able to retrieve them. Not until two years later, because we didn't. Two years for the energy to wind down yep. in those No, for us to see the, exactly, for us to see the event, because we're stuck. Time, again, is a, is a particular frequency that we're experiencing right now. For example, when you're awake, time slows down. Notice how uh, the brain goes between, like right now we're probably at around 30 hertz, 15 to 30 hertz, which is very low frequency. When you have peak physical activity, it peaks at 100 waves per second. The more active the brain is, the physical brain, um, time starts to slow down. Ever notice when you're doing sports or playing tennis, a second is, is, is got this volume to it. And when you go to sleep and the brain slows down, Three hours, chunks of time go by like that. It's, it's the same thing. So why do the dates match up? Why did Roswell happen on the same dates as Trinity, but two years later? Uh, I believe it, 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 was just, it was curious. They were watching the event. The nuclear, they have never detonated a nuclear weapon, so they probably didn't know what we were doing. And the gamma blast just threw them like a shock wave out to the sides, and, and we saw the effects two years later. Uh, you have a question? Mm -hmm. was magnified by the presence of an electrostatic field around it. The width of it, yeah. Right. Couldn't that also have been true for those objects that were in the... Uh, in well... Also experiencing that, so they might not be of the same size. Or as, as it's very possible we're only seeing the field and the waves. I mean, you'll have to actually see my film on my table, Evidence, the case for NASA UFOs. I'm sure a lot of people have seen it. But I actually freeze frame those waves, and those waves are clear. I mean, there's a spiraling wave... There's, you know, there's different ring-shaped waves. And again, had this been an out-of-focus incident, none of those waves would show up so crisp and so clear. But why is it so? If it takes a field that substantial, mm -hmm. the actual physical object might not be that large. Well, what I'm suggesting is the whole physical object is becoming uh, transparent or reducing its mass gravity effect. 
Therefore, it becomes transparent. So I don't know the answer. You, you could be right. The object could be smaller, and you could be seeing the field. Trevor Constable took photos. The photos you saw, and, they were, and I had to be brief in my presentation today because of time, over Los Angeles, a translucent disk on its side with a black hole in the center. And then the other one was over Landers, California, where George Van Tassel, that should be a name that could, could uh, ring in a few ears here, a psychic channel in the 1950s was channeling Ashtar, the space being, allegedly. And before sunrise, when it's very cold in the, Earth, you know, in, in the, in the air environment, Trevor Constable was taking pictures in the ultraviolet. If you take high-speed infrared film without red filter, you get near UV sensitivity. And lo and behold, all these UFOs were showing up that no one could see, but yet he was claiming to be in telepathy with them. They all have the dark center and the translucent mass. Now, the space being Ashtar, you know, in, in this alleged telepathic communication, and, and I'm not criticizing it because I think it could actually be a real communication. Ashtar says the, the spiral radiation that radi emanates from our ships gives the illusion of spinning. That the ship is not spinning itself, it's the waves distorting. Now, look, look at a lot of Jaime's footage in the first UFO. It looks metallic, but you can see the distortion, the slight blurring around it. Those are the waves. And those waves are evident in a lot of the good, a lot of good footage you'll see. In the uh, STS-75, uh, one question I always had about it when I looked at it, mm -hmm. because I have the tape, mm -hmm. is why none of the objects stop, change direction, they all appear. I don't see a single one that doesn't just go in a straight line through the field. Yeah, well, they all go different velocities, and they, and they never stop. Um, and if you look at a lot, I've got other footage in, from different missions that Stubbs gave me. I've got one moving over the curvature of the Earth and disappearing on the other side in four seconds. It does 1,000 miles in four seconds, which comes to 0.9 million miles an hour. Um, I mean, yes, there are examples of UFOs making high-speed turns, which I also have on the tape. Um, sudden stops, I've never seen on, on any of these uh, space shuttle tapes, no. Um, but people have seen that. And, and again, that's evidence of zero mass. Um, if you, even if you had your own gravity field, as Lazar suggests, and, and Lazar's equations are really brilliant um, on, on element 115, I think it is. Um, if you have your own gravity field and you're, you're, you're holding yourself in your ship in a gravity field, you still will compete with other gravity bodies when you go by them. For example, when, when the moon goes by the Earth, it pulls on us. When we go by the sun, it's a pull, it's a relationship. So if you have your own gravity field, you're still going to get g-forces. That's why I suggest that that's not what they're doing. When you reduce the mass, you reduce the gravity. And when the mass is zero, the gravity is zero. And that means there's no g-forces. So you could stop on a dime. You could turn right. But you'd have to want to. I mean, we've, we've seen it. The evidence is there. But I haven't seen it in the NASA tapes, no. Well, that would, ha that would be the ultimate, because in order for humans to fly in these crafts, we would have to be able to transform our mass safely without harmful radiation. Now, when you see cases like you know, the, the UFO landing in the schoolyard in Mexico and all the radiation burns, one of the things you find about different states of, and, fr and different frequencies is that if two, of, two frequencies are very far apart and they collide, for example, the human body or mass is very low in frequency. Physicists say near zero, and, and that's a huge subject in itself. And when sunlight hits it, you get heat, which is radiation, right? That's a, called a differential or difference between those two waves. A high-frequency wave meets a, whole, a low frequency wave. You have a transference of energy, you have friction, and you get heat. But if two high-frequency waves meet, there's a very low differential. Therefore, if you're in a high-frequency state, you could fly into the center of the volcano and not get burned because you're higher in frequency than the flames in the volcano. There is no heat because there's no friction. There's no differential. And, and, that's, and that's, again, further evidence of the, some of the states that these craft are actually in. In the front there. What do you uh, think the, uh, the dark center and the dot is on these? Uh, well, the dark center, I believe, is the point in the field when you look at the actual waves wrapping around the same patterns you see in crop circle waves also, by the way, um, is the point where as the diameter of a wave gets smaller, its frequency is getting higher. And eventually, in the vortex, everything goes invisible and appears black. So what is the notch on the outside? The notch, 
possibly an artifact of the camera, but also if you look in my film, we go into this ancient Dropa stone connection. Uh, these stones found on the Tibetan Chinese border and also some in the Philippines that are large stones with round holes in the middle and notches cut out of the side. And they give us a connection to a legendary star system of Sirius. So it could be an artifact of the camera, uh, the CCD, or because as a bright light source is pointing at the CCD, sometimes you get an artifact. Or it might be something in the actual uh, form of the, of the, of the low mass craft. Could it could also be uh, the frequencies going up as you get towards the center, that camera is only able to sense a certain frequency spectrum. Mm -hmm. so that's what I mean, yeah. It appears black. That's, that's the hole in the center. Now, Billy Myers, in, in the literature on the Myers incidents, they actually show where there's a gap, a notch, on the outer ring of, of the disk shape of the UFO. And there's a reason for that notch or break in, in the actual windings, the coil windings, in, in creating the wave generators. What's that? It could be part of the design. According to the Meyer papers, if, if they're real, uh, there's a reason for the notch. In, in the craft that, that Myers has, has looked at. And it's very bright light. I can see somebody around here. Oh, I just want to tell you, I was on a trip, recent trip with Ashland. Where? Scared to death. In Ashland? With Ashtar. Oh, with Ashtar. Oh, wow. No, no, I was scared to death. Oh, you were scared. He took me up when I was 16. Mm -hmm. and I was so scared I went to the fetal position and they couldn't straighten me out. Mm -hmm. Wow. I wouldn't walk. I wouldn't walk. It was just me and him. Why were you so afraid, do you think? To was out in the middle of space and get out of ship that is absolutely see through. Yeah. He's going, you cannot fall off. And he wanted me to walk inside the side. It, see, that's like the one that was over out. Mammoth. I, I yeah. Call it saran wrap. Right. But I wouldn't look down because if I looked down, then I know I would think I was going to fall right Yeah, down. vertigo. The, the. I'm so afraid of heights, I took up skydiving to get over my fear of heights. And I since jumped from, t yes, it works. You know, now I have way less fear. And that, that is always, your fear has been very similar to mine. And I've had experiences, too, being taken aboard uh, translucent ships. I came a long way. I stood there, I'd look out, but I would not take one step. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe the next time, I might take one step. Yeah. And look at Bud Hopkins' book, Sight Unseen. He goes into the invisibility factor in abductions. I couldn't put that book down. It, it just came out uh, uh, last year. Can you tell us what happened when you went on board the ship? And what the well, ship my experience is, I mean, I've, I've been also practicing meditation for 25 years very seriously every day. And, and um, I have another book out about some of those experiences. And it's, it's, I've never really spoken about it at these conferences. But um, I believe essentially angelic presences, including if you go to Enoch, the first prophet in the Bible, he describes a, a disc-shaped craft and literally God, the most supreme being, and angels were inside of that, that craft. But I don't believe they're mechanistic. I think they're actual spiritual temples that can land and, and appear to you either interdimensionally or physically and can transform you and take you aboard them and take you in certain vision states. But I've been taken aboard huge translucent ships also um, in, in out-of-body states. The one I saw, the one that was in Mammoth that showed up on the Nikon camera, I, I, was, I just grabbed that photo because I said, there was a time when I had one of those appear to me right by my bed. And I don't know whether I was in the body or out of the body. I'm sure it, it pulled me out of my body. But I could see it was just like saran wrap, like this yes. woman just said. Exactly. Translucent, no, no motor, no strobing, utterly silent, and it just wrapped itself around me. And I was inside of it, and it was like this. No door, nothing. And you could see through it. And all of a sudden, I was up and gone, and I went through all these different star systems and arrived in the center of our galaxy where I was spoken to by some beings, and then I was taken back. So this thing seemed to be controlled by higher spiritual entities, and yet it wasn't a, it wasn't a mechanism. I think a lot of the... Uh, the, the Ashtar stuff, I mean, literally could be, these are ships that are beyond the concept of transforming mass into light. They are resurrected forms already, and they have no need to come back to a, a physical mass form. Um, right, you know, this ship, that really, um, just more information, this ship, it's funny you said that, because, I mean, I can feel the sound of the ship, and I can sense that was on it, there was no motor. Mm -hmm. 
just in a chair, sit here, and he had me stand beside him, and his back of his chair was down. Mm -hmm. He was laying down, but his legs were like this. Mm -hmm. And there was no motor, like, unless it was in his chair. You know, no. This is an interesting factor that once you consider the idea of a low or zero mass state craft, the very low amplitude, which low amplitude means low punch, waves that come out of the human brain could affect it because low amplitude waves can affect a small amount of mass. So once the mass is reduced, the mind can be linked with the craft and the two can essentially become one. You can tell it go left and go right and, and kind of merge your, your nervous systems. But until the mass is in that reduced state, the low amplitude waves of, of the human brain are, would have very little effect. But what would have a lot of effect if you got millions of people thinking the same thought together, well, that would increase amplitude towards a single thought. And even Art Bell has done experiments like that on his radio show. And some of those experiments actually terrified him where there was a big forest fire up in Canada that they couldn't put it out. And everybody thought, let's make it rain. And it did, and it put the fire out. Um, so if a lot of people think together the same thought, you increase amplitude. That's one way to manifest. But a single mind thinking one thought, especially if it's opposed to a bunch of other waves coming from other human brains, is very weak and chaotic. So that gives us an example of how you know, thinking together in large groups, how powerful that can actually be. Could you give us uh, your thought on 2012? What do you think is going to happen there? Well, I'm not a prophet, but, you know, I've, I think that, that uh, most of the dates that people have given us so far, and I always get my hopes up. I mean, I got water and beans for, you know, for that uh, 2000 date. <laughs> and I was like, okay, the world's going to end, and it never happens. I'm not going to hold my breath. I, I wish the second coming of Christ and all the angels would happen. I, I wish the stories that Giorgio Bon Giovanni told me really do happen. They sound great. Oh, but I, I hope they do. But I'm not a prophet, so I can't tell you when. You know, I, I hope they do. I believe those dimensions are real. I've experienced them. I've, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of ghosts and interdimensional beings with my own eyes just through practicing meditation. And I've been visited by ascended masters, which I've actually seen you know, with my own eyes and, and experienced their presence. And some of them are my teachers in my wave work. Um, but um, prophecies and dates, uh, that's, that's not my business because I mean, everybody's been wrong on, on that department. A few people have been right you know, once in a while. But uh, I don't really want to go there. What my goal is to have this country form a serious consortium in Washington to not only investigate UFOs, but to make a motion to have our scientists in all of our universities studying this for the benefit of future propulsion. Let's do it here first, and let's don't let China or Russia do it, or, or, or especially you know, the Middle East, where we might lose this precious gift of freedom that, that was paid for um, and by, by people who gave their lives so that we could think these great thoughts and be crazy and, and, you know, and, and go on the fringe. Well, I mean, I've been approached by individuals at NASA. I know top people over there, which, whom I haven't even talked to about UFOs. I talked to them about bomb detection, like Randy Brinkley, who's program manager of International Space Station, and Bill Shepard, who's flown on seven, five or seven shuttle flights. Um, I brought the question of UFOs up recently to them in an email and got no answer back. Um, I just thought I would like, test the water over there. But some people at NASA are very open. I just think we're too, we're too shy about this, and we're going to lose this. Every major invention was done here first. It may not even, like Tesla was not you know, born in this country, but in his country, they wouldn't fund him. J.P. Morgan financed him here. This is the greatest country in the world when it comes to putting money into new ideas and, and humanity benefits from it. Um, the hydrogen technologies and, and solar panels, all of that happened here first. So, God, let's don't make this mistake. And if, if the most we can do now is, is to, and I try to do this as much as I can, intimidate politicians, threaten them with, hey, look, they're researching this in China and Russia. Do you guys really want to have them figure this out first? I mean, do we really want to lose that? Maybe we can scare them in, into in creating a consortium. I don't know. But that's my goal right now, politically, uh, to, to have this in every major uh, university in America. Anyway, thank you very much. We got a 
Dan Aykroyd, Unplugged on UFOs will be tonight um, at 8, and, and if people want to stay up really late after the banquet, it'll be going on then as well. What's that?